Welcome to the Price Law Podcast. I'm super excited to be here today with not only Mike, our founder, but also Michael Rossman of Sport Life Distribution. So today is June 23rd. Uh, this might be episode 103, depending on when it goes up. But either way, this has been a little bit coming for a little bit. We're super excited about uh, the discussion of changes in distribution and retail in, in this landscape. And so to get to sit down with Michael from Sport Life, we're going to talk a lot today about um, what distribution is in, in sports supplements, how it works, why some brands may choose to go one direction or the other, and overall talk about trends in the industry. So, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Super excited to talk today. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I'm equally as excited to join you guys today. So, uh, well, usually the easiest way to get into this stuff is to talk a little bit about like where you're from, how you started this. So if you could give us a little bit of a background on how you started in sports supplements, that would be super helpful. Sure, sure. So... Geez, this goes back to, I want to say, late 90s. Um, I started with Costello's distribution, actually. Um, not too many people might remember that entity, but that was the beginning of what became Optimum Nutrition. Uh, long ago, they used to be a distributor and carried many different brands and started their own in-house brand, Optimum. Um, and quickly, that became you know the focus of everything there, and they got out of distribution uh, I joined them down in Sunrise, Florida, which was one of the Costello brothers. Mike Costello um, was based out of that operation. Of course, the main headquarters was in Chicago area. Uh, started there doing sales, you know, calling on accounts. Didn't really know much about sports nutrition. I always played sports, uh, you know, in high school. Um, was very interested in it. Um, so I got to learn quickly about, you know, proteins and fat burners and all that good stuff, creatine, et cetera. Um, and was lucky enough to start with a company that just exploded. I mean, we all know that Optimum became a premium brand and, you know, still exists today and that, at that level. Um, so it was there for until about 2004. And that's when I came across a little company out of um, Dallas, Texas named Dimatize. So again, I struck gold twice and I can't say that it was anything to do with me, but maybe just luck. Um, and was able to go over there and start to build out Dimatize's domestic sales team. Um, I brought a bunch of the guys from Optimum with me there. Uh, we started an outside rep program, and that brand just exploded. Uh, so that took me up until about 2014, and that was around the time that, you know, post uh, the big cereal company acquired Dimatize, and I felt like it was time for me to go out on my own, do my own thing, I really like the idea of distribution because you're not married to one brand. You know, if something isn't cool anymore, it's uh, you just move on to the next thing. So I jumped out on my own, started Sport Life Distribution. Uh, that was back in 2015 is when when we you know rolled out as Sport Life, and uh, man, it's been a it's been a great ride since then, and here we are today, and um, you know couldn't be happier with the decision I made to to start this organization. Awesome. So uh, I think a lot of our followers who are just end, end, end user and consumers won't know exactly who Sport Life is. So we we'll want to sure. get into that. But Sport Life, you, did you start with supplements or I, I think wasn't there apparel at first as well? Or am I? Man, anything we could get our hands on is what we started with. Uh, you know, 2015 was a little different in terms of the dynamics of distribution. There was some other big hitters that were kind of in their uh, peak at the time. So you know, we took the old get in where you can fit in mantra. Uh, we were more boutique. Um, we didn't do much in terms of national brands. We, we started with a lot of brands that, frankly, were were uh, created by store owners that just didn't have the um, uh, connections, I guess, to get in with some of the bigger entities. So we brought them on. And it was a good fit because this is when, you know, Amazon was kind of hitting their high peak and, and a lot of stores, retailers, we're, we're losing business and they didn't really know where to go. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the void that we filled. We started bringing retailers and consumers together um, with brands that were a little more niche, a little more boutique things. You wouldn't find, you know, commodity. Like if you're shopping in a, say a Costco or a Walmart, you know, you had to really kind of know people on the inside, I guess this was kind of an insider brand and we were the distributor of, uh, of that type of stuff. So uh, I think Mike's got it kind of on a, on a right pit foot there. There's a lot of consumers that are getting very educated in this industry. They, they, they know a lot about um, supplement facts panels. They know enough to know like what they're looking for, but they don't really understand the inner workings of the industry. So 
one of the things I'm, I'm excited to learn about from you or to kind of share out there is what exactly is the point of distribution? Why wouldn't I, as a store, just go straight to the brand and purchase from them? Well, I think the industry doesn't really matter. You know, whether it's sports nutrition or shampoo or laundry detergent, eventually industries mature to where there's enough consumers out there that distribution becomes necessary. You know, if you go back to, again, say maybe the 90s when, when sports nutrition was just kind of becoming a thing, there wasn't enough stores, there wasn't enough consumers to really need distribution. So really what you had back then was stores just going right to the manufacturer and getting the brands that way. Um, today, you know, there's probably between gyms that have pro shops, uh, independent retail stores, health food stores, you know, somewhere between six or 7,000 retailers here just in the United States. So, you know, and then if you look at the brands, shoot, there's probably two, 300 brands at least. So for an individual store to try and buy you know, 150 brands directly from the manufacturer, not plausible. So really for us, it's all about ease of doing business, making life easier for the retailer. So if you have a store or a gym, you call us up, you tell us what you need and you can get it all tomorrow. So we're kind of the business to business Amazon model, if, if, you, if you could call it that, and that we try and be a one-stop shop for all the retailers to get everything that they need and get it tomorrow. Um, and, and that's really what I think separates us from some of the other options in our, in our space. Totally. Makes cool. So, so when you say like uh, the store can call you with what they need, do they always know exactly what they need or do they say, we're, we don't have a good creatine supplement or we don't have a, we need a new pre-workout, give us something. Or is it more like I need X, Y, Z brand? Sure. Can you. Yeah, that's a great support? question. I, I would say it, it goes both ways. And, you know, to that point, getting everything and getting it in a day or two is, is the benefit to the, to the retailer, right? Well, the benefit to the brand is the question that you just asked, how do they get exposure and, and uh, get in front of all of these retailers that buy from us? Well, coming into sport life distribution is how they do it. And a lot of times, you know, the brands that do a great job with their marketing, um, getting their name out there, yeah, the stores, the retailers, they call us and they want that. They know they need it because people are walking in their doors asking for it. But then again, they might say, hey, you know, we need something in this category or we need something that fits this void. That's where my sales team really steps up. Um, you know, collectively, we've got about a dozen sales guys all over the United States, and they've got probably 200 years experience combined. And a lot of them worked for distributors before I even existed with Sport Life. So they know the ins and outs. They know most of these retailers. And I think there's a trust there that, you know, we're not a bunch of high commission sales guys pushing house brands. We don't own any brands we sell. Um, we're really just a logistic, dis, you know, solution to the stores. And we can offer solutions for voids that they might have in their uh, sets. So uh, you're talking about like 200 years of uh, distribution experience. There's a ton of uh, a lot of history in there. I think that a lot of people miss out, like how much I mean, we talk about the industry right now. People want to talk about Rise, Ghost, Raw, and, and those are all exciting and everything. But like people mm -hmm. forget that there's there were years of you know you talked about Optimum and Dimatize, but there were years of you know Nutribol and all sorts of different eras in distribution. Would you say that recently, because of it, TikTok, Instagram, you know, online stuff, this has all kind of changed? How have you seen the the industry change with with this kind of uh, shift? Uh, from a distribution and retailer standpoint, yes, it's, it's changed in that marketing specifically social media and influencers has become the primary way to speak to the consumer. I mean, I hate to say it, but I go pretty far back again to the, to the optimum days. And even before that, where it was designer way or EAS, um, you know, and social media didn't exist back then. So, you know, it was really just kind of walking into stores, talking. The retailers were the influencers back then. Um, they would tell the consumers what was great, what they needed, and, you know, supplement review, a, a literal book that you would buy. You know, these were the ways that you'd speak to these consumers. Um, and to that point, a lot of stores, as, you know, the direct-to-consumer model, you know, really took hold, it scared them. They didn't like the idea of, of brands going past retail and selling directly to the consumer, that's all changed now because there's separate consumers for each market, 
right? So you mentioned Alpha Lion, Rise, um, Bucked Up. These brands have done an amazing job at, at marketing themselves, and they've done it through their social presence. And what does that translate to? Well, it's consumers walking into these stores saying, hey, I want Bucked Up, or I want, you know, Ghost, or any one of these brands that has really done a good job with that. And as a distributor and retailer, we've learned to embrace it. Um, and that's even played a role in, in determining what brands we do and don't onboard. If a, if a brand or a company doesn't have their finger to the pulse of those types of marketing channels, it's going to be a hard sell. So we try and do that due diligence prior to bringing brands and which again makes it easier for stores. They don't have to sift through endless product catalogs. You know, we kind of cut to the chase for them and put forward what we think they need. We're not always right. Sometimes they tell us, Hey man, you guys need to check this brand out. And uh, that, that holds a lot of weight too, as far as what the stores tell us they, they need. So how, th so in terms of like uh, product offerings, like obviously right now we hear a lot, like things all throughout, like you hear a lot that energy drinks are super saturated. You know, have you, have you seen shifts in the actual categories that you're distributing as well? Like Mike mentioned clothing before, but I have to imagine you guys have gotten a lot more functional foods and drinks than you had previously. Yeah. Functional foods is easily the biggest growing category for us. And some of these brands, you know, are big names that have been around forever. Your Lenny and Larry's, your quest power crunch, you know, those aren't going anywhere. They're great brands, great products. Um, but you know, like wicked cuts, um, something better bar, you know, a lot of these foods and snacks are really driving the uh, revenue for us and seem to be of the most interest to the stores. Not to say that pre-workouts and proteins are dead, but there has been a shift and specifically to energy drinks. And if any of the brands are watching, please no more energy drinks. Um, it's insane. I mean, I don't know what's driving it. I guess they, they see, you know, what Celsius did with the sale to PepsiCo or, you know, where Bang's at. But it's a tough channel to get into. You know, there's only so much space in the cooler. And every brand out there is telling us, hey, this is the energy drink we have or this is the one we've got coming. And it does present us challenges. I mean, there's only so much space and, and warehouse that you can own uh, before you start to reach capacity. And the drinks, they'll get you there pretty quickly. But we haven't gotten to that point yet. Uh, in terms of, you know, shutting down the energy drink pipeline, but we're getting there. Okay. Well, so while we go into energy drinks, let's say I uh, run Mike's Oklahoma shop here, just a small mom and pop. Well, how does this person generally, uh, how do they choose what energy drinks go in their cooler? I don't have a huge cooler or anything. Is it basically just like by demand or are you, are there incentives offered from some of these brands? Like there's so much, I, have fig I figure that some brands might even want to like pay me to stock it. I don't even know how it works. Yeah. It's obviously um, another great question. You know, with, with drinks, it's, it's a little more difficult to get creative as a brand to, to drive those incentives because of the weight, you know um, again, this may not resonate with, with the consumers, but the stores, they certainly know the plus one uh, talk of the world where, you know, buy three of these pre-workouts, get a fat burner free. That's easy to manage for a brand because it's light. It doesn't take up a lot of space. It's easy to ship and you can kind of cross promote that way. So there's the incentive for that with drinks. You know, really it just comes down to consumer demand. Um, I've brought some drinks in that I thought tasted great. The packaging looked great. The pricing was, was phenomenal. Couldn't sell it because nobody's ever heard of it. Nobody's coming in asking for it. And you know, if you're a retailer, you're not really talking about drinks. People come in, they grab it, they pay for it, they go. There's no sale happening there. It's just, hey, I need a Celsius, I need a bang, I need a rise, you know, I'm grabbing it, I'm out the door. Um, same thing at gyms. So really you kind of take that interaction out of the equation and it's really just a convenience purchase. And I would say protein bars and a lot of the functional foods fall into that as well. And that's why, again, you know, the category leaders have been category leaders for decades now it's really hard to knock them off because they just own the market. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so I was going to yeah lead into the yeah, functional food. So in order for a brand to break into energy drinks or functional food, they need to, they need to create this demand. Like there's not much of getting this, just magically getting into stores, knocking out the C4 cans, which have a ton of demand. 
you actually have to like do some serious marketing and then you, it's a red ocean basically mm-hmm. and yeah we're kind of hearing the same thing from other people i know america energy they uh they shut you know shut down their doors and uh you can listen to them on on doug's uh boss uh, boss status podcast but mm-hmm. pretty much like they're they're done with energy drinks until 25 25 and he warns a lot of companies that it's uh it's tougher than it seems and you see tons of people throwing a lot of good money into uh into energy drinks and they're gonna they're gonna lose it at some point so it's kind of a it, it's it's interesting hearing you confirm that yeah it worries us because there's some very strong brands that um i think they'll probably rue the day they got into beverage because of the financial strain it might put on them Again, being a distributor, we're not necessarily beholden to that. You know, we'll just we'll make our adjustments and go where the market leads us. But if you're a brand and you sink all of your resources into equipment or a co-manufacturer and you have to run very large amounts of inventory, it could sink you. So it's it's definitely risky. I think one of the things that people don't talk about enough is how expensive it is to ship heavy cans. You know, like uh, that's the reason why direct consumer can sales are not popular. It's one reason that Amazon's done well with them, but it's also a reason that distributors do well is because if you're a store, I can buy, you know, I don't have to buy an entire pallet of one thing if I buy from you. I can buy m- many different energy drinks and fill out my, my case that way. Yeah, no, you're, you're definitely right. And again, you're speaking my language, being a distributor, our second highest expense behind our payroll is, is shipping. Um, so we have to constantly be cognizant of that and manage it. Um, we've gotten creative to find ways to do that without actually running our own trucks, um, which is great because, again, it allows us to service that core network of uh, retailers that, that we work with. And they don't have to buy pallets. They can buy a case or two if they want. And again, if, if, you're, if you're a brick and mortar retail store, beverage isn't really your main focus. It's just an added convenience. If you're a gym, totally different story. We do a ton of business with all the Gold's gyms out there. And they move a lot of drinks and it's a very important, you know, asset for the pro shops. Cool. So let's, all right. So let's switch uh, temporarily to another perspective. Uh, now that consumers might understand a little better. I, so imagine I'm a, I'm a new brand, you know, ben, uh, price ball launched their new, their new product. Why should I consider working with sport life uh, in, in today's market? Not, I don't, you don't have to pitch yourself, but there's a lot of considerations when you're giving your product to a distributor in that, you know, it might end up on Amazon sites or, you know, I, I have my own sales reps and you're also selling to stores. Like, how do you fit into that? Like today's industry? Sure. Another great question. I like it. Um, without getting too deep into the weeds on this, one of the things you mentioned is the Amazon piece. That's the uh, 500 pound elephant in, you know, in the room there. Amazon is both a blessing and a curse to brands. If you don't manage it, it can spiral out of control and you lose price integrity, which then, you know, why would a store want to carry a brand that a consumer can pay the same price they do and get it you know, delivered to their doorstep? They don't. Um, drinks, it's not, not necessarily as relevant because of the weight, but yeah, for us, and this has been since day one, we haven't changed our focus. We want to dominate the specialty retail space. And what does that mean? It means the independent operator that has one gym or one store, maybe they have three stores. Uh, Basically anybody in the United States that sells sports nutrition, that isn't say GNC or vitamin shop, that's our core customer. Um, So if you want your brand in those channels, then we're your distributor. We don't sell to anyone that doesn't have a brick and mortar store. Um, The reason we do that is again, to prevent Amazon, eBay, any third party sites um, that that might sell the products, we we don't allow that. Not to say there's anything wrong with those channels, but the brands that come to us, they don't need our help with that. They manage it themselves. And some of them go to the extent to make us sign contracts saying that we won't do it. And we could be fined substantial amount of money if we did. So like I mentioned, there's an onboarding process we have here. You have to send pictures of your store. And trust me, I've got Amazon sellers that send fake pictures of stores and they try everything to sneak their way through. But, you know, we have a hard stance on that. So that's number one. Number two, I would say is, again, back to my sales team. I mean, I couldn't be happier with the crew that we have. They're amazing. Some of these guys have been doing this literally for 30 years. Um, they know what customer service means and how important that is to our stores. And we try and make this as easy as possible to do business with. Um, if you want to buy one unit of something, you can buy one unit. If you want a case, great, buy a case. Uh, 
pretty much anything you need, we're going to get it to you. So if you're a brand and you want to be in Mike's Oklahoma supplement shop, you probably should get with us because Mike's going to definitely want to do business with us. And if we don't carry your brand, it's just going to be one more reason for the store to not want to carry it because either they have to go direct, which is a hassle, and also comes with high minimum order requirements, uh, credit card fees, and some other challenges I won't get into. But or you have to find another distributor. And today's you know options are very limited to where maybe five, six, seven years ago, you know you had three or four viable distributors that all kind of carry the same amount of brands. That's not the case anymore. You know we're pretty much it for the U.S. specialty um, segment. Well, uh, yeah. Can we get into that a little bit without, I, 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 we don't need to disparage competitors or anything, but what, sure. what's going on? How are you, how have you differentiated? Um, I, 2020 seemed to have wrecked a lot of, a lot of this. So maybe we can, I don't know what, what angle you want to take, but like, how do you differentiate? Yeah, I'll definitely try and take the highest road I can take here. Um, you know, and again, I've got, I've worked with all these distributors, you know, they weren't, they weren't, and I still don't really consider them competition now because, as the industry has matured, you've seen distribution go into specific channels now. Um, one of the big distributors that has a, a tight connection to the military, they obviously service the military bases, and now they've taken a pretty strong um, grip on FDM, meaning food, drug, and mass. So like HEB down in Texas, um, Dick's Sporting Goods, Academy, some of these big names you know, if you're a brand that wants to get into those channels, we're probably not your best fit right now. And and we, we're fine with that, right? So, I mean, it's kind of a shared space there. Um, 2020 did play a big role in this. You know, COVID uh, forced the hand and, and, and drove a lot of the big, you know, entities like 24-Hour Fitness, I believe even Gold's, you know, declared bankruptcy because during COVID, you couldn't keep gyms open. Uh, specifically depending on the state you were located. And, you know, a lot of these entities made up a large portion of the revenue for some of the distributors. And when that gets shut down immediately, um, you know, and you have to write off all that balance to bad debt, you're not going to survive that. And nobody would. So it's not a fault of theirs. It was just wrong place, wrong time. And I know it sounds kind of malicious, but, you know, it, it frankly benefited us because we weren't leveraged with large corporate accounts and big, you know, net term balances. So, you know, as these, as these other dis distributors kind of retracted and regrouped, man, we just pushed ahead. Um, so I, I feel bad because, you know, a lot of these guys were friends of mine and they lost their jobs and, you know, went through some hardships and, and that sucks for anybody. Um, we tried to hire as many of them as we could because I think they're, you know, they're great assets to our company as they were to the companies they worked with before. So kind of a question based off of that. And again, take the highest road you can here. I'm, I'm just trying to maybe make some discussion that I find kind of interesting is there's a lot of brick and mortar out there that feel slighted by FDM bringing in brands. Like these are brands who have been built on the backs of very hardworking mom and pop shops. And, and I, I, when I ask this question, I want to ask with the utmost respect for all those people. Do you find that a distributor who works with those FDMs may have less support from that kind of group because they're aiding that industry? Like, do, do you think these small mom and pop shops want to stick with brands that are sticking with small mom and pop shops? Oh, hundred percent. I mean, you'd be crazy not to, you, you know, again, I'm not going to name the specific brands, but you probably know who they are. If you sell too much of a certain brand, you're basically asking your customer base to just go away because they're going to find cheaper options, more convenient options to get those products. And to the consumer, this isn't just about making money. I mean, you have to look at it two ways. If a, if a brand gets so big that their you know, number one objective is to get into Walmart or get into Costco or get into Sam's, you know, at what point do they start changing their products to meet the requirements of the retailer versus meeting the needs of the consumer? Not to say that a product you know, winds up in Walmart, you can't trust it, but you know, personally, I'm not shopping there for sports nutrition. You know, I might go buy fishing lures there or something, but you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna buy my pre-workout. Um, and that's why specialty stores will never go away. I mean, I've been in this again for over 20 years, and for the last 10 of them, all I hear is, "Oh, retail's going away. It's all going online. It's all going to mass gen." 
No, it's not. It hasn't done that at all. It's, it's actually grown. And it's not just sports nutrition. I mean, look at wine. If you're into drinking expensive, you know, hard to find wines, you're not going to, you know, the grocery store to get it. You're going to like a, a boutique wine shop where you're going to talk to somebody that knows that bit, you know, knows about it and can give you intel just like sports nutrition. So I think it's kind of the same thing. As far as um, retailers supporting distributors that do or don't do that, I don't think they care. Um, you know, we carry brands that are in mass channels and we carry them because stores have to have it. You know, d does a store get rich selling a Lenny and Larry's cookie? No, but if you don't carry it, you might lose somebody that came in and buys their protein and pre-workout and then also wants some functional food. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a necessity at that point. And we just try and make everything as convenient as we can. You know, if a store doesn't make much margin on a brand, trust that we don't either. So we're kind of lockstep, you know, with them in terms of uh, really supporting the brands that support the specialty brick and mortar retailers. It makes a lot of sense. I totally understand. And it seems like there has to be um, like cycles of this because as brands grow, they'll look at other channels. I, I mean, I can't think of, I mean, you mentioned two brands that did incredible in distribution for a very long time, but it seems like at some point they have to move on to that next level. Not many are going to continue to double down on distribution further and further and further unless you could, I mean, unless you have any great partners that you keep seeing like doing that, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. I, I mean, personally, I kind of disagree with that. Um, I mean, Show me one brand that has sold to a larger equity group or, you know, a big corporation that has seen massive success in the mass channels. There's a couple, but, you know, I worked at Dimatize. I saw the numbers that we were doing there. I saw the presence in the, in the United States and abroad. You don't see it anymore. Yeah, they got into Costco, but what happened to that? I don't think it's there anymore. So now they're being forced to kind of rebuild themselves in the specialty space. And I think they can do it and they are doing it. Um, but then you look at a brand like Optimum, same thing. I mean, you know, they sold to Glambia, an Irish, you know, uh, I think they're a, what, like raw material manufacturer? Like very conglomerate. Well, yeah, there's many, yeah, many things. Yeah, so, so, you know, for them, it's simply just weight, you know, and, and raw materials that they probably produce anyway in the whey protein. But I don't see that necessarily dominating, you know, sports nutrition anymore. EAS is gone. I think high tech basically snapped up the trademark because it, you know, what was it? Abbott laboratories that bought them. They just threw it away. Biggest brand in the history of sports nutrition goes to Abbott and they're like, eh, it's trash. So I don't know. I mean, I guess it's an inevitable journey where every brand views that the big mass channels are, are the promised land for them. And in some cases it might be, you know, if you're a cooler drink, you probably want to be in every grocery store and sporting goods store in the country. So that might make sense. But, you know, if you're a specialty boutique supplement company, I don't know, that may not be where you want to go. So, but to your point, the stores, the stores that have been around more than a few years, they know, they see it. And I don't even think they complain about it anymore because they know nobody's really listening. Um, they just have to prepare for it. So it is a cycle. And if you've read in a brand for three or four years, trust that it's probably going to have that downturn coming soon. And again, these guys, these retailers that are good at what they do, they know that and they plan for it. Because it seems but I like to think that we do as well, but we're probably more reactive to the trends of the retailer than um, proactive and cutting things ahead of time. It makes so. sense. Uh, and, and to me, I mean, it just, I, it just seems logical because it's just speaking business wise, if you're at the top of your distribution game, you could continue to add more SKUs, add more SKUs, but at a certain point, you have to look, you have to look at like a bigger market or something. Um, so interesting. Okay. I really appreciate that insight because it's, that's a little slightly more optimistic than how I look at it. Cause I, I see it as almost inevitable for any brand to eventually have to die out. Cause how do you keep the industry's market share indefinitely? Right. Yeah, that, I mean, that, if you knew the answer to that, we'd probably be on a different podcast right now. But um, I think what is happening to an extent is that direct-to-consumer, the D to C, so to speak, has somewhat replaced that big picture of mass down the road. You know, so nowadays, and, I, and I'm hopeful to see some of these brands that we mentioned earlier, um, if they can make this work, but really 
you want to have a strong direct to consumer network, right? Which is going to be your marketing department. Um, you want to have your specialty US because that's your influencers. Those are your retailers. And then you've got your international business. If you can capture those three and do well, I don't really see there being this glaring need to get into the big box stores. You know, unless you're selling a commodity item like toothpaste or shampoo, you don't belong there. So now, what with that um, that trifecta you have there? In your opinion, does Amazon come into that picture at all? Yeah, yeah, that that's a big piece too. We forgot. So that's the fourth <laughs> leg of the chair is is your three PL on Amazon, and I almost view that as direct to consumer, um, yeah, yeah, because me. again, nowadays brands they they pretty much own that that channel they don't need a distributor's help in that they don't need a retailer's help in that they have their own in-house people that work with amazon to you know develop content market through those channels and again that's selling direct to consumer so yeah i guess you could separate it out but i would i would put that in the d2c bucket it's funny to me okay. because it seems like uh these we, we see a lot of startup brands from TikTok and instagram influencers or whatever where it's like uh, you know a head who's you're kind of a spokesperson and they're looking to scale these as easily as possible. To me, it almost feels like instead of taking on wholesale on your own, which as someone who has done wholesale, it is, it is a long process. There's a lot that goes into it. That is not like direct to consumer at all. You could use sport life as your wholesale division. Like it seems that it could be a way to scale and delegate without having to do the wholesale on your own. Yeah. I mean, obviously I'm going to be biased and agree with you on that point. Um, but I feel like that's why we're here. And that's that's really the message we try and and uh, you know bring to the brands. And I believe it 100. percent It's not a sales pitch. I mean, there's a reason why we have four warehouses across the United States. There's a reason why we have salespeople across the United States. Uh, if you need product and you need it tomorrow, we can get it to you. Why would you want to deal with 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 100 different suppliers? I mean, think about it. If you're if you're a, a store owner, let's say you have one store. Can you imagine trying to reconcile that? And let's be honest, these brands, they might be great at marketing. They might be great at creating product. They suck at shipping stuff. I can promise you that. If they didn't, I wouldn't exist in the capacity that I do. And most of them will admit that. They don't want to have to sell to stores direct. And I think what we're trying to correct, if I can say that, is a history in the industry where distribution didn't necessarily play well with brands. And your brand was kind of stuck to whether or not the distributors put their best foot forward with your brand, gave the best pricing out, and almost manipulated it to where if you didn't play ball, they could shut you down. And that mentality led to the whole direct to retail um, mess, I would call it. And now we're trying to undo that disaster and say, look, any other industry that you look at doesn't do that. I mean, think about it. Do you think Budweiser, you know, Anheuser-Busch is sitting uh, at a boardroom somewhere and saying, hey, Joe's Bar down the street is crushing Budweiser. We need to take them out of distribution and sell to them directly. It's ridiculous. Like, no one thinks that way except this industry. And, you know, I think it's just because out of necessity there was problems with how distribution and retail worked. But like any industry, as it matures, those things kind of work themselves out. So... You know, we're lucky enough to be here at a time when, you know, these channels are being solidified. And I think stores are starting to understand that, you know what, Spore Life isn't here to rip me off or take advantage of me. They're just making a living off of taking products from manufacturers and brands and bringing it to retail. That's it. I got to say, when I came into this industry, I worked, I, I did I did a bunch of wholesale for a brand that like one of their wholesale, like unique selling propositions was working direct. Like it was, it was something that we were proud of that you worked straight with mm -hmm. us. You didn't go through distribution. And so to me, distribution exactly is what you're saying. Like there were problems with brands. You couldn't trust them. And this was early in Amazon back when, you know, we would pay price plow for the data to find out who was selling on Amazon and stuff like that. Like, right. it, it was a huge fight to, to keep your, your uh, pricing integrity and all this stuff. And, and everyone was dealing with it. So it's really cool to see uh, distribution coming back into the conversation in a way that it's someone you can trust, right? And that's, it, it seems like you're, you're very well fixing the problem. Well, we like to view ourselves as partners of both the brands and the retailers. And part of that comes with visibility. Um, you know, we share data. 
we let brands know how they're doing in certain regions, certain states. We send them spin reports of how their products are performing. Uh, and we share that data with the stores too. So we think it's a valuable um, asset for all of these uh, entities so that they can kind of see where their brand is and the retailers can see where they might be missing. Um, the other side of that is not having multiple distribution points. When you've got five or six distributors in the United States with your brand or your products, you have no control. You don't know who's selling to who, who's doing what, and it that can be a big bigger problem. And that's why, you know, we started here in Florida. That's where I'm located. Um, but I quickly realized the only way we're going to turn the corner is if we can present a national solution versus regional. If we just stayed here in Florida, all right, that's great for the Southeast, but then what do you do with the rest of the country? So we didn't, we really couldn't present solutions until we became a national distributor, which is what we are. And, you know, again, if a brand trusts us, we can get you everywhere you need to be in the United States. Um, and we'll share all the data that you need to see that. Whereas before, you know, again, this is speaking as somebody that worked on the brand side, you didn't get that information from, from your distribution partners. They kind of held it close to the chest. And again, that's because they were worried that brands were going to try and sell direct. So it was a vicious cycle that just wouldn't end. And again, it's kind of getting unspun now. And I think, unfortunately, it took something like COVID to force that to happen. But here we are. Wow. Okay. Yeah, this is good. Once we get you rolling here, I'm, I'm learning a lot here. So you, earlier on, you had mentioned that you don't have, um, that you don't have trucks. So it, not even in Florida. No, we, we've ent entertained it and it's all I ever hear, especially when you start talking about beverage. It's like, well, do you run your own route? Do you run your own trucks? And I said, well, why does it matter if my driver is driving the truck? Like, how about I just buy FedEx? Does that mean I run my own trucks then? I mean, I don't know what the difference is. That's so. what I was going to ask. So you, you have some, like, just, you say you're, you're nationwide. I'm, I'm assuming I'd like to know like some of the, the logistics, um, for my store in Oklahoma, for instance, is there a warehouse closer than, than Florida? I'm assuming maybe yeah, we have like a that. warehouse in Dallas, the Dallas. Right. Okay. There you go. And uh, Okay, so you have multiple warehouses, and then from there you're shipping UPS, FedEx, like whatever works best. Yeah, FedEx UPS and FedEx are, are going to handle all the ground shipments, and like any other business that works with them, you know, it's a, it's a, an endless battle of who's going to give me the best pricing. Um, so, you know, when you see things like gas prices go up, that has an impact on us because shipping rates go up. Inflation certainly doesn't help. We're all dealing with that. Um, but again, back to running trucks, the only time you really need to run a truck is if you're merchandising product. So if a store needs you to come into their store, bring the products in the store, put it on the shelf, merchandise it, put the shelf talkers up. If you're running a grocery store, you might need that. If you're running an independent supplement shop, you probably don't want people coming in touching your, you know what? So we just feel like we don't need it. And again, it's not that I don't wanna do it, but for us to be successful, and I've said this before, there can't be any ego in distribution. I mean, I am in here with my little logo above me. That's about the extent of my uh, ego. But, um, man, we run things lean. You know, it's it's low overhead. Uh, the more money we spend on marketing sport life or creating assets or, you know, sponsoring bodybuilding shows, that's all cool, but that costs money. I'd rather pay my staff and give that margin to stores than put my name out there. Because, frankly, consumers don't care about sport life. They just care about Sport Life getting the products to the stores they shop at. So, you know, if you come to one of our locations, it's not going to be paved in gold. We don't have giant, you know, fitness equipment studios set up. There's no, uh, you know, uh, anything special going on other than warehouses with product, warehouse staff and stuff coming in and going out. And I like it. It's simple. I show up. We work every day. I mean, just last week, we were a little short staffed here. I'm back there packing boxes myself. So. You know, it's all hands on deck here at Sport Life, and that's that's the way we like it. That's exactly what we like about this podcast. Sometimes there's a lot of nuts and bolts going on behind the scenes that not everyone knows about, and it's good to like show for the end users. You know that there's other things that make this product. It doesn't just magically appear. Someone's got to yeah. do it. And well, yeah, the funny thing too is, um, I don't know if it's funny or not, but we reuse every box we get our hands on. So of course, the products that come into us come in boxes. And since we don't require stores to buy full case quantities, you know, we break these boxes down. Well, rather than throw them out, we reuse them. Whereas in the past, I think other distributors would actually have like custom made boxes with their name and logo on it. 
which again, it, it looks cool. And I guess it's a good marketing opportunity, but I mean, we're shipping four or 500 boxes a day from every location. Think about that two or $3 a box times, you know, 5,000 boxes a day. I mean, that's a lot of money. And here in Florida, you know, I think half our boxes come from my wife's Amazon habit. So I just bring them back in here. And where I think I crossed the line is um, <laughs> wonderful wife. We just had a child, right? So I'm going through a lot of diaper boxes these days. And I brought them in and somebody got a shipment and one of the boxes with their product was like a Pampers box that we packed up. And I guess that's where they said, all right, that might be pushing a little bit. So, <laughs> no more diaper boxes, I promise. But you might see some stuff that's got like my home address on it because I'm not throwing anything out. I love it. Oh, that's that's incredible. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, yeah, it makes sense. You're just running those numbers in your head. Like it, it turns into a half million dollars a year or something like that. So, yeah, it does matter, even though it, that's funny. I love it. Yeah, there, there is a lot of expense behind the scenes that, again, when I worked on the brand side, you don't really think about. Um, but, you know, it takes manpower here to pack the boxes and, and, and put the orders together. Packing tape, packing paper, um, the way the type of box is used. I mean, again, people don't want to receive their shipments with damaged product because then they may have a customer that was expecting that and now they don't get it. And now they lose that customer. So it's not just about making money. For us, it's about doing things that make life easier for the retailer. And again, part of that is running lean operations so that we can give the best prices to the stores so that they can make the money to stay in business and operate. What about melting protein bars, chocolate coating? That's a challenge. So, you know, I have a warehouse in Las Vegas, Dallas, and South Florida. You can imagine most of the year it's it's not very cool here or any of these places. So. Um, we have to build out separate spaces in our warehouses that are um, climate controlled. And that, of course, is not necessarily cheap, but it's a necessity because we do carry a lot of products that are chocolate enrobed. Um, even some of the soft gels and gummies can run into those, those issues. So the solution we offer is, is cold pack. Um, and we've had to try a million different things to try and figure it out. But at the end of the day, if you don't have next day shipping, it doesn't matter what you're putting in those boxes. It's going to melt. So, you know, the first part of that is to have enough warehouses to get product to people in a day. And then next is using the uh, cold pack. So I forget what the charge is. I think we even lose a little bit of money on it um, in terms of what the cost of the cold pack and the certain type of uh, wrap that you have to do. And then you got to buy big Ziplocs to put it in so the condensation doesn't make the box wet. And you know, it is a rocket science, but it costs a couple bucks. But, you know, that option is there for every customer across the country if they want it. Cool. So and I have one one other question, um, financial related, uh, going back to like 2020. So you mentioned like certain if maybe D distributor A had a lot of stuff in 24 hour fitness or golds and golds had to shut down and that led to like write downs and everything. Whereas with Sport Life, you're working with Mike's Oklahoma shop. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm assuming that like there was a, the money, the financials were different there. Do does Mike's Oklahoma shop have to pay for everything up front, or are there like what are the general terms, and how does that compare to to like the the larger outfits that were kind of crushed in 2020? Well, you're, you're putting me in a tough spot here. On this. Am I, I, I don't even know if this is, I'm just trying to learn. I don't even have a clue what the right or wrong. No, at. I'm at you know jokes aside. I'm glad you asked because this is more. This isn't really going to relate to the consumers, but the retailers know this. Um, yeah, so as, as any business, you have to be financially healthy, right? And for distribution, traditionally, it's super low margin. I mean, as a standard, you're normally talking about one to 2% to the bottom line. So there's no room for error. And again, that's why you go back to 2020 and with COVID, what happened? I mean, it doesn't take much to, to sink the battleship, so to speak. So um, as far as payment terms, yeah, if you have one store, you have a credit card on file with us. You send us your order. We run the card as soon as your product is shipped. Um, pretty straightforward, pretty easy. Um, we are expanding. We're a growing company, and we are going to continue to fill some of that void in some of the, I, I would call it, specialty FDM. Okay, like Gold's Corporate is a great example of that. These guys, you know, traditionally they were hardcore, you know, lifting gyms. They have pro shops. They sell some aggressive products. Um, I wouldn't put them in the, you know, Walmart, Amazon box by any means. Um, so, you know, they've got, I want to say almost 70 gyms within their corporate network. 
well, they're not going to put a credit card on file for every one of these gyms. That just doesn't make sense. So we do have to extend them terms. Um, and there's a handful of other entities. So really the lens we look at it is if you're a corporate account that has multiple locations with a central receiving spot, there's a lot of moving pieces there. You need time. You got to move product around. You got to manage a lot of inventory. Um, so in those cases, we will extend net terms depending on their credit worthiness. I mean, there's a process you got to go through. We got to check references, look at financials, make sure that, you know, they're viable. Um, but that is the slippery slope you get into where if you overextend yourself with those type of entities and your, your balance sheet gets out of whack, um, you can run into problems. And we're very cognizant of that. And there is business that we walk away from because for us, you know, the benefit doesn't outweigh the risk. But that's, you know, that's something I have to look at every day. And uh, there's no perfect answer to it. It's just, you know, making sure that you're, uh, you know, crossing your T's and dotting your I's and not making any major mistakes that you're going to regret. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. So you're, I'm all caught up now. Now you had mentioned that you have data, you're willing to share data, trends and everything. Do you care to tell us, like, give us any cool trends that you've noticed any weird things? Like maybe in the Southeast, they like a certain protein bar better than in the Northwest or something like that. Is there anything? You know, we, we this could probably be a whole separate call we do. Um, we have a department we, that, that, you know, pulls that data. Uh, the only thing that I could speak to, because my finger isn't to the pulse quite like the sales guys in terms of processing the orders. Um, you know, I see the, the totals and, and, and where the brands are falling month over month. Um, what I would say is more of a regional visibility. And it kind of plays in with your question about, you know, why would, a, why would a brand be direct to retail versus go through distribution? So a brand that I'm sure most of your consumers are familiar with, Axe and Sledge, awesome brand, does a great job with their, uh, you know, direct consumer marketing. Everyone's heard of it. People ask for it. All the stores carry it. They're based out of the Pittsburgh area, right? So they've got a warehouse on the East Coast of the United States. So obviously, as you continue west, their footprint kind of diminishes. Just because if you're a store in Los Angeles, are you going to wait six, seven, eight days to get your product and pay for it the day it's invoiced? I mean, that's a challenge for them. So because of those challenges, they decided to uh, come on board with Sport Life and, and use our services. And now we're seeing those trends regionally start to uh, pick up. And you see that with any brand that was traditionally, um, you know, direct to uh, consumer and, and direct to retail too, like Bucked Up. They're based out of Utah. So same thing, huge on the West Coast. But as you got into states like Florida and the Northeast, they didn't have the same presence. But then they brought us on as their first distributor and that changed overnight. So a lot of it isn't so much about consumer demand as it is logistic solutions to the retail space. Um, and that's what's driving it. Another brand that's just exploded that, um, you know, I'm surprised with the numbers they're putting up is Anabar. Came out of nowhere, we brought it on, and man, that thing is just a monster. Again, they were a direct to retail set up out of the uh, Houston market. And, you know, once you got outside of Texas and surrounding areas, you didn't see them as much. Now they're everywhere. And I'm not taking credit for it, but I think we provided a solution for them to uh, expand where they were and, and broaden that footprint, if you will. Okay, I'm on your website looking at the brand page. So it's just Anabar is a protein bar. Looks like you have a bunch of a few flavors, frosted yeah, strawberry cupcake. Yeah, if you haven't tried it, it's, it's the most delicious bar I've ever had. Yeah, we've had a and lot. I promise of we have no ownership in anything, so I don't get any <laughs> uh, credit for that. It's it's just pretty dang good. The, yeah, the, the, our community is like a flutter with their flavors. Apparently, there's protein packed candy bar. Okay, I gotcha. Sweet. Well, we might have to do a video on that and uh, toss your logo up there as a place to get it. Cool. Yeah, before I get in trouble, Bear Bells right there with them, too. Another Ben's been talking about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I sure. actually <laughs> just did all of theirs. I heard incredible things. They're amazing. Yeah. Yeah, we met with Mike Watson at our uh, little golf tournament there in December, uh, uh, actually in May. And he, he brought some of the new flavors, the soft chews and stuff. Man, amazing. So they got, they got some cool things going on over there for sure. Awesome. So, <clears throat> all right. So while we're on, like, I, I, while we're on talking about your favorite things, uh, what are your energy drinks? Like what, what you specifically, not, not sport life, but what do you enjoy energy drinks? Uh, sea bomb. I don't know if you guys have tried that one. Delicious flavors, no weird aftertaste. And it's not crazy caffeine. I think it's only like a hundred milligrams. So for old guys like me, we can drink it and not have a heart attack and, you know, go on with our day. 
Uh, Rise has some great ones. Just Work from Axe and Sledge has been huge. Um, we did recently get Celsius into our floor location. We'll have that at all other locations. Their uh, vibe, like Peach Vibes, those new ones are awesome. I'm trying to think who else. Uh, there's some other ones that we recently brought in that are doing well. well Noctogen RTD is a great, you know, hardcore pre-workout beverage. So did the, I'm sure I'm forgetting cool. somebody. Did the 12-ounce cans change things for you with the Bum Energy? Well, yeah, there's two points to that. One, I think the consumer prefers it. I mean, I say that, but I'm sitting here drinking a 16-ounce bang drink. Uh, Purple Haze, I think that's a reference to some other distributor. I don't know who it is, though. Um, so the 12-ounce drinks as a distributor, I love them because they're way easier to ship. We can put them in four packs, which uh, I won't bore you with the details. It just it's, it's better for distribution. In fact, we didn't carry 16-ounce drinks until this year. Um, and we had to renegotiate shipping rates with FedEx in order to do it. <clears throat> but it does appear that there's a trend. Um, you know, TJ over at ABE, they have their drinks that came out. Those are great. Those are 12 ounce drinks. And it, and it seems like most of the consumers like that. I know me personally, I do like Bang. I have a bunch of them here. I can't tell you the last time I finished one. So I think it just comes down to who, you know, who the consumer is, what they want. But 16 ounces is a lot of, lot of beverage. I never you know finish the 16s. I'm right there with you. I sip them. Oh, there's always some left at the bottom, but 12 ounces I can finish every single time. Yeah, and we are, uh, we're talking with um, Seabum right now. They've got a Sprite flavor that's about to drop, and we should be the first to market with that for specialty. So I think that's going to be a big one for us too. Well, that's a clip right Was there. Was that just a Instagram. leak? Or was that out there? <laughs> I might have screwed up. I may not. I didn't say that. Never mind. <laughs> I think I'm allowed to say it. Well, we'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. I was going to ask a question. Um, oh, you mentioned Celsius. What's the story with that? I mean, uh, it, it, I guess that's a big deal, but it seems like it, that they've been around for a while. Is there something something special with Celsius? Yeah, I mean, and I would say Bang falls into the same category. It, it's kind of a never-ending saga, right? You know, the distribution rights change from time to time. Um, so Celsius, if I'm not mistaken, was recently acquired by Pepsi. So this isn't a distribution right. They actually bought the company. So if you want to get Celsius, you have to go through one of their channels. And they've made it very difficult for specialty retailers because, you know, Pepsi isn't very interested in sports nutrition. It's not where um, the revenue comes from. You know, they're, they're going to convenience stores and gas stations and uh, grocery stores. That's that's where the lion's share of that goes to. So, you know, consumers still want the product, still want the drinks, and the retailers need to have it. So there is a bit of a challenge, and we feel like we found a solution to get a consistent supply of the, of the beverage and, and bring it to uh, all markets. Like I mentioned, we did have it land here in Florida recently, and we'll have it at all of our distribution centers um, by the end of next month. The only reason we don't have it at all of them is we're actually moving a couple of our locations into bigger spaces now uh, because, frankly, we just ran out of room, which it's a good problem to have, but it's still a problem. So uh, you mentioned uh, previously that uh, some places had a hard time getting Celsius. Do you ever leverage your distribution to move stuff that maybe you don't necessarily like want to be selling already, but you know the demand is such there that you know you just know that you can kind of get in with it yeah i mean there's there's brands that if they weren't as popular it wouldn't hurt my feelings just because they're either difficult to work with in terms of pricing and and, and terms um or they just have internal issues where you know the in, uh, products don't show up when they say they're going to or they miss ship you know same thing with with distribution i mean if a distributor screws your order up all the time eventually you just get sick of it and you say i got to find a different solution Brands are the same way. I mean, you're kind of uh, beholden to the to the demand of it, but at some point you just got to say, you know what, I just can't, I can't do it. And there's probably one glaringly uh, hole in our catalog right now in the beverage world, and I won't say who it is, but they definitely fit the uh, fit the mold of a pain in my ass. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I got to yeah, be honest, this gotcha. is a. Uh, packed hour i actually have no other questions i got everything i needed to talk about so i'd be curious if mike if you have anything. well yeah i wasn't planning on asking this question but you seem very very business savvy and intelligent um june 23rd 2023 what's your overall economic 
um, outlook given what you see, you have a lot of feet on the street, a lot of sales guys talking like, how is, how's the economy looking from your perspective right now? And it could be personal slash business, like whatever you want to qualify. Yeah. So strictly through the lens of sports nutrition and in our world, I'm very bullish on our future. Um, I think from a revenue standpoint, we've got a long way to go. Um, as far as the amount of doors that we're in somehow, some way we're not in all of them. And that's, that's on us, you know, and that's one of the reasons why I was really excited to get on with you guys, because it is difficult to market a distributor. You know, you can't just buy Google AdWords and, you know, consumers again, don't care. So there's no, there's no social platform for just retailers, or at least not one that I'm aware of other than what you guys are doing. Um, so that's our biggest challenge is just getting the name out of there, out there. And, and frankly, that, that comes through word of mouth, which we're very grateful for. I mean, our retailers are probably our biggest billboard so to speak. Um, but I'd be remiss to not mention that, you know, there are challenges to the economy and inflation's a problem. You know, when people are paying what they're having to pay for gas and eggs and groceries, you know, I think at some point, some of these non-commodity products that we sell might get squeezed and, and nobody wants to see that. Um, is there a recession in the future? You know, interest rates keep going up. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of downward pressure on the economy. Um, we got an election cycle coming up. You know, I'm not going to get into the political side of things, but at the end of the day, I just want to see the economy strong. And uh, I mean, let's be honest with you. It's mostly middle class, hardworking, blue collar people that are buying these products. So, you know, if the economy is doing poorly and it's the middle class that's getting squeezed, it, it hurts me. It hurts our retailers. Uh, and none of us want to see that. So, you know, hopefully some of these things work themselves out. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we're not going anywhere. I think there's a need for what sport life does. And I think we do a really good job at, at what we're needed for, but we can always get better. And uh, I'm super excited to see where we take this, man. I, I think this is just the beginning for sport life. Excellent. Yeah, it seems like we have a few extra products to cover and everything. Um, one, one thing I think would be cool whenever we do it is it would be fun to get like a panel on this. Um, with some of your sales guys, just if they wanted to talk about trends, like, yeah, the, the Northeast guy talking to the Southwest guy, like what, what's hot over here or there. And maybe that gives away too much of the, the secret sauce or something, but having a, a fun panel like that, talking trends could be really productive for some of the brands you work with. And that that's the kind of stuff that we just love. We love trends. So uh, yeah. I would love to get, get into that sometime in the future, but we definitely have a, a cool, we, I learned a lot here, so I appreciate it. Yeah, I think your audience would love to hear from from my sales guys because frankly, they're they're one of them. You know, all of these guys that work for for us, um, they're consumers too. They take the products. Trust me, they're up here every day at the warehouse going through samples and snagging whatever they can. And that's one of the perks of working here is you pretty much get all the supplements you could possibly want. And uh, to that point, if any of your listeners out there want to break into the sports nutrition industry see us. We need good, talented people that are uh, ambitious and, and love sports nutrition and, and want to get, you know, be a part of it. I'm so glad you brought Sport that up. I really wanted to bring that up. What, um, you know, obviously this is subject to change with time. It's, it's June 23rd, 23, but what, what kind of positions do you have that you generally are always open for? Like what, what could people look for? Well, yeah, first let me just drop a link. Sorry, go ahead. Life distribution.com slash all lowercase supplement dash industry dash jobs. And uh, we'll have a link to that in the, the the show notes, because you do have a few things open here. Yeah. So, I mean, we're always looking for warehouse staff. Um, so anybody that's located near one of our distribution centers, Dallas, Las Vegas, Cleveland, or uh, West Palm, you know, we always need staff there. We're always growing. We're always looking for people and it's a fun environment. You know, like I said, I'm the owner, I'm back there pulling and picking and, and hanging out. And we have a lot of fun back there. Um, secondarily, I would say sales staff, um, you know, for, for me, the ideal candidate is somebody that's just very passionate about products that knows about products and would love to talk to stores and, you know, explain to them why as a consumer, they come in and buy what they buy. Uh, somebody that's worked in retail is also, um, an ideal candidate because again, they know the challenges that, that stores face. So who's better to work with them than somebody that that's dealt with that, uh, but really, at the end of the day, anybody that that is is passionate, you know, interested, and wants to get into this industry and be a part of it, 
I'd love to talk to them. You know, we're always looking for qualified, talented salespeople, administrative staff, warehouse staff, um, HR department. I mean, you name it. We're a fast growing company and uh, we need talent. So anytime we come across somebody, if we feel like they'd be an asset, we, we find a home for them here. Awesome. Well, I really don't have anything else to get through. That was uh, really uh, super informative for our consumers. I want to circle back, like Mike was saying, I think to get some of your team on here would be really cool because we talk a lot with you know CEOs and brand owners and stuff like that. But I think you have some guys who are literally boots on the ground that we could definitely have a fun conversation with. You guys tell me when. I know they'd love to. They love seeing their faces on here and hearing themselves talk. <laughs> me, not so much, but you know, I think we did all right today. Cool. Maybe we can get, we can get down to Florida sometimes, do that with you guys. Please do. We'd love to have you. All right. Uh, so, Michael, if, is there anywhere on social media that people can find you or do you kind of stay more behind the scenes? I stay behind the scenes. That, that's been my uh, trick to success, I think, is just making sure I don't do anything or say anything stupid. So I just stay back here and make sure the bills are paid and uh, the staff does what they do. Of course, the stores can use our website as an asset uh, to see the brands we have, see what's new, look at promotions. And um, we are working on an ordering portal that should roll out next month so that if they do choose to just go online and place an order themselves without having to you know, call, email, et cetera, that will be an option for them. So we're excited to roll that out here soon too. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Michael. We'll be talking soon. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Had a blast.